Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for coming. So I'm going to start uh, immediately. We have a bunch of slides to go through. Uh, the learning objectives of this part of the uh, two-hour lecture, or the two lectures, um, it will be to review the importance of dental disease in dogs and cats. Um, it will be also to review the basic aspects of the diagnostics and uh, therapeutic um, steps involved in, the, in regards to dental disease in dogs and cats, and to review the basic tools necessary to practice uh, good quality dental uh, work. So the basic setup, in order for us to do dentistry in small animals and dogs and cats, obviously we're going to need an anesthetized patient. Unlike in humans, uh, everything that happens, even the diagnostic um, process, is uh, mostly performed under general anesthesia. And uh, we're going to need a few basic tools as well. We're going to need uh, the diagnostic instrument, uh, which applies to most situations will be the periodontal probe, which is used to recognize uh, the most common dental pathologies. Also, a dental explorer is a common instrument that we're going to need. These are two uh, very uh, affordable and uh, easy to use instruments, yet they provide a lot of very useful information. And uh, we're going to need a chart as well to record everything that we find in the mouth. Everything needs to be recorded because there's a lot of parameters that we're going to um, acquire and uh, we need to record so they're, um, they allow a, a proper diagnosis. And we're going to need intraoral radiology, which is critical in regards to diagnosis of dental disease. The two, the clinical aspects of um, dental disease recognition, the, the um, data that we acquire with the probe and the uh, explorer will be complemented by radiographs. So the two will allow a proper diagnosis. And we're also going to need a dental unit, which is uh, fundamental to do the work itself. After we have uh, come up with a diagnosis, we will need to execute a treatment plan, which will require a dental unit, typically an air-driven unit, although there's also electrical powered um, units, but typically it will be an air-driven one. And we're going to need a few basic instruments that um, usually include uh, basic surgical instruments like scissors, uh, scalpel handle, uh, needle holders, etc., but also uh, will require uh, luxators or elevators for when it comes to extracting teeth and uh, forceps to deliver the tooth. So in regards to the patient itself, um, first of all, we need to recognize why dental disease is important. Um, it is First of all, it is an inc inc dental disease is incredibly common. It is by far uh, the most uh, common type of pathology in dogs and cats um, above any other kind of disease, uh, digestive, respiratory, et cetera. Uh, it is uh, by far the most common. And uh, it can be painful, so it will uh, affect the quality of life of the animals. And it represents, also it represents a source or a site of chronic inflammation and infection that will only not have local consequences, but it will also have um, sy potentially systemic consequences. So uh, in regards to the general health of an animal, it's really important to uh, uh, recognize disease in the oral cavity, uh, disease that affects the teeth, and diagnose and treat them properly. Like I said, it can have uh, serious functional consequences. Uh, typical ones include, for example, um, Pathological fracture of the mandible is not rare, and especially in uh, small animals that have advanced disease. It, it can be so um, severe that it can compromise the, the jawbone itself and lead to pathological fractures, which will be um, a, a bit more serious to treat or difficult to treat. And it can also, uh, this is an example, for example, of an odontogenic infection that uh, chronic one clearly that uh, led to infection of the jawbone and this is a case of osteomyelitis. This is simply a very severe periostal reaction due to the uh, chronic infection. And like I mentioned, this will have an impact on quality of life and in regards to uh, animals at the shelter, it will most likely end affecting the adoptability of these animals. How does the diagnosis occur? It uh, starts um, in the exam room, it will require 
ideally if it's available. Uh, proper history, a complete history. It will be important to know the duration of um, the problem, the clinical signs or the symptoms observed by the, by the um, owners or previous owners. Um, a physical and an oral exam will reveal some useful information. However, these two are typically very limited in regards to um, revealing extent and severity of dental disease and sometimes the nature of the dental disease. So, like I mentioned a, a minute ago, the uh, thorough and complete and final diagnosis will come only with the uh, animal anesthetized. And it will include a clinical part where we uh, do a visual inspection of all the extra and intraoral um, areas, but we will also require the probing that I mentioned and intraoral radiography. These three will lead or allow a proper diagnosis on a tooth by tooth basis. And if we have this information, we will be able to put together a coherent, logical uh, treatment plan that will provide true actual clinical benefits to the, to the animal. In regards to the history, uh, some problems uh, have an acute presentation or an acute course, and uh, they may be very obvious, like, uh, for example, a, a navel's tooth will be uh, very obvious upon visual inspection. Um, dental alveolar trauma in general will have other concurrent signs. Um, if there's dental alveolar injury, it will either look like a navel's tooth or a luxated tooth, and they will be, there will be likely associated soft tissue injuries and uh, potentially other maxillofacial injuries as well. Uh, other signs of when, for example, there's an odontogenic infection, it can reveal acutely uh, by the animal suddenly having a swollen face or uh, the appearance of a draining tract. Typically, the draining tracts, uh, it is the extra oral ones that are obvious, obvious to the clients, uh, owners, or clinicians, or uh, anyone involved, but oftentimes these draining tracts are inside the mouth so they will not be easily recognizable. Uh, the more chronic disease will uh, have a, a little bit more subtle presentation, sometimes very hard to recognize. Uh, the most common manifestation will be halitosis. This is by far the most common reason why uh, at least client-owned animals come to, the, to see a professional is because they uh, can no longer tolerate the smell. But more subtle signs can be present as well. If there's dental pathology, there may be um, uh, some degree of discomfort or pain, and the animals, even though they manifest them uh, very subtly, they hide these signs very well as an, probably an instinctive um, uh, the, the result of animal instinct, but when they do manifest it, it will be uh, by signs like pawing at the face, or uh, they, may be, they may come to you with a little bit of drool, uh, sometimes bloody um, salivation. Uh, and if you uh, pay close attention to these animals, they sometimes will also have um, signs like difficulty chewing. They will drop the food as they try to eat or be, you know, be clearly hungry but um, get really frustrated when they try to pick up the food. And uh, jaw chattering is common in cats. Uh, cats are very sensitive to certain dental pathologies like uh, tooth resorption will oftentimes be associated with jaw chattering. And some of these animals don't show any other sign but just behavioral changes. They become aggressive or they become uh, withdrawn and uh, sometimes it's a purely dental pain. The visual inspection or the oral examination that we can perform when the animal is not under anesthesia, like I said, is very limited and it will allow a very tentative diagnosis, oftentimes will not be even close to revealing the real severity and extent of the disease. It won't allow you to put together a specific treatment plan, especially not a tooth by tooth one. Uh, in client owned animals, it does allow you to provide a cost estimate, that a rough cost estimate. Um, and it's, it is, in order to get the most information out of it, it is good to have um, routine, use a very systematic approach where uh, you make sure it's almost like um, a list that you check um, step by step to ensure that you're not missing on anything that is more subtle and that you're not 
paying attention to just the obvious. And uh, by that I mean uh, you can establish your own routine and that may include, for example, I start first on this side and then I move on to this area of the mouth and then I move on to this third area of the mouth and try to be uh, systematic and use the, uh, stick to the routine. And also it's good to go through categories of dental disease and by that I mean for example, when I do an oral examination, I am looking, I, first of the first thing I do is an oral, um, extra oral exam. Then I palpate the lymph nodes, I um, palpate the facial structures, bones, look for swelling, any asymmetry, etc. Then I go in the mouth, and uh, the first thing I look at is the way the animal occludes the bite. Uh, because when the animal is under anesthesia and the tube is in place, you won't be able to assess the occlusion anymore. Then uh, I look at periodontal, uh, the periodontal status where I look at the periodontal tissues that are visible to the um, eye and that is basically the gingiva. I look for signs of periodontal disease that would uh, include gingival recession, gingival bleeding, uh, root exposure, frication exposure, anything that um, suggests that there's uh, inflammation or loss of periodontal tissues. I then go on to another category that is the endodontic or endodontal status where I look for signs of pulp disease. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about in detail about periodontal and endodontic disease in a minute. Uh, but this is just to give you an example how I go through categories so that I don't miss out on anything. I also pay attention to the anatomical uh, aspects if there's missing teeth, if there's supernumerary teeth, malformed teeth. And finally, um, I leave a category for things that uh, I don't think really fit into any of those, and I uh, list them there. And everything I try to, you know, write down uh, so I have an initial idea of what's going on. Then, when the animal is under anesthesia, oh, sorry, this is kind of what I was telling you about the extraoral occlusion, anatomical, developmental, periodontal, endodontic. Also, look at the soft tissues to see if there's signs of. Um, uh, for example, chronic stomatitis or ulcers in the um, oral mucosa, etc. And uh, then we will um, we move on to the anesthetized part of the exam where the animal's under anesthesia. We will again do a visual inspection of the entire oral cavity, and, but we will be able to focus on a tooth by tooth basis uh, using the periodontal explorer or probe. We're going to be able to probe around every single tooth, check for mobility, uh, loss of um, periodontal tissues, etc. And everything uh, when the animal is anesthetized will go in a chart. These are the parameters that we typically look at when we um, examine each tooth and those include mobility which can be um, graded in a 0, 1, 2 or 3 which we will um, explain in a little bit. Solcular probing is inserting the probe in the solcular space to check for uh, increased depth in this um, area. Gingival recession is like uh, shown here on this photo when the gingiva migrates apically down the root. In this case, uh, obviously, that leads to root exposure, which is a sign of loss of tissues or periodontal tissues. Um, the gingival index is um, not a very useful one in terms of what you're going to end up doing with that tooth. Frication is a very important one, and that is uh, defects, osseous defects in the area where there's uh, two or more roots. And anything other than just not periodontal, but say, for example, fractured teeth, discoloration of a tooth, um, etc. Whatever else is abnormal, you will want to record. Intraoral radiography, like I said, complements your clinical examination. It is essential um, to fully diagnose dental disease. This is just an example of what a full mouth study looks in a dog. Uh, the, the way it is mounted on, a, on the view box, if you're doing uh, conventional film radiography, is what's called labial presentation, where everything is displayed uh, as if the animal was in front of you with the mouth open. So all these, um, in this area of the, of the screen, are the right maxilla. This is left maxilla left mandible and right mandible. So this is the typical dis way to um, display the radiographs. This is just to show you an example of, of what it would look like in a cat, very similar, just probably less radiographs needed. Um, in dogs, the number of radiographs to get a full mouth study varies anywhere from 10 to 20, typically. In a cat, you can get away with just 10 or 12 radiographs. Now, this sounds a little bit absurd, I know, in the um, setting of a shelter, but it's actually not. Uh, because uh, 
even the, the time factor shouldn't be, shouldn't prevent you from getting um, grading graphs uh, if that's going to allow you to come up with a precise diagnosis because with a little bit of practice you will be able to get a full mouth study and a little bit of help, somebody processing the film. Uh, you'll probably be able to have a good quality diagnostic set of radiographs in 10, no more than 20 minutes. Uh, just to highlight the importance of dental radiography a bit more, this is a chart where uh, somebody looked at um, the value, the diagnostic value of dental radiography in dogs and cats and concluded that uh, this is a list of uh, clinically relevant findings on the radiographs that were not revealed on a clinical examination. And some of these are quite high, so you know, one out of three uh, you will probably miss on just purely clinical examination. So this, like I said, it's uh, not redundant to take radiographs and do a thorough exam. It's just very complementary one with the other. Another uh, common um, question is, can I use conventional medical radiography in, in, instead of dental radiography? And the, unfortunately, the answer is not really because the amount of detail and information that we get from um, dental radiograph is uh, not even close to what we would get on a skull radiograph. So uh, skull radiographs are pretty much useless when it comes to dental pathology. This is, again, just to highlight the importance of this, is just to show you how much detail we can get on an intraoral radiograph. We can assess periodontal uh, status clearly by evaluating the alveolar bone, periodontal ligament space around the roots, the shape of the roots, uh, if there is signs of lysis around the apices of the roots, et cetera, et cetera. None of these we would be able to recognize in a skull radiograph. Uh, why? Because the contrast is not good enough and there's a lot of superimposition of structures. So um, no, it, it's not unfortunately useful. Intraoral radiology, and I insist a lot on this because I think um, even in uh, shelter settings, it should be implemented. Uh, this is kind of one of the main messages I want to get out there. And um, I'm going to explain how or why it's feasible. Um, it, even though it does require specialized equipment, you need a dental x-ray generator. Uh, you don't necessarily need sophisticated digital technology for it. So obviously there's uh, digital systems available, DR and CR. They are expensive, they are delicate. Um, so, um, I mean, if you can have them, great. But if you have film, film is uh, incredibly valuable. I can tell you that, for example, us at Cornell, uh, we were using film until probably a year ago for dental uh, disease. We moved on to DR and CR recently, but film was still considered um, very useful. And it's, um, to me, I think the minimal um, everyone who does dentistry should have. Um, and at least in private practice, uh, there's no justification for the cost of the equipment because it's first, it's not that um, uh, expensive, and second, the return is really high if you start using it. And uh, I, the only downside I would say is that there is definitely a learning curve. Um, you will have to take a lot of radiographs before you get proficient at it. But um, it's just a matter of learning the technique and practicing it a lot. So um, even that shouldn't be an excuse. Uh, in regards to the equipment, the biggest part of the equipment will be the generator. And there's different types of generators. There's wall mounted, there's um, similar ones but just on wheels, floor mounted. And there's also uh, portable handheld ones which um, have uh, at least this particular model, the Nomad has FDA approval, is uh, safe uh, to use if using the proper uh, safety measures. And it is very, very um, practical and easy to use and it will, you know, you'll be able to carry it around rooms, uh, buildings, or even um, facilities. The cost of this uh, generator, for example, I checked yesterday online and I think the latest generation, the latest uh, model is probably around uh, $8,000, I think. And um, the way in which the film or radiographs are processed if you're doing uh, film, there's uh, different sizes. The, the most commonly used ones are the occlusal size or size 4. That will allow you to take a big area in the mouth. 
Then there's the periapical, so-called periapical film, which is a size two that will allow you to take groups of uh, two, three, or four teeth. And in small animals, these don't really fit in the mouth, so you may have to use size zero, especially in cats or small dogs. And you can either manually process them in a um, little chair-side dark room, which inside contains a, um, uh, the chemicals necessary, which are developer, uh, fixer, and water. Or if you are doing a lot of them, uh, you can get an automatic processor, which is um, really easy to use, very nice and convenient to have. And the cost of this equipment is probably around $2,500. Um, the digital equipment will be uh, will range in terms of cost between ten thousand dollars and twenty thousand dollars, depending on the specific model and uh, maker that you get. Anyway, going back to the patient, um, there's also anesthetic. It, when you do dentistry, there's important anesthetic considerations uh, to keep in mind. First, uh, dental uh, procedures will will require a diagnostic and a therapeutic portion and typically everything gets done in the same during the same event during the same session uh, it would make sense to anesthetize just to gather information and then uh, to treat so everything gets done at the same time and therefore uh, they tend to be relatively long procedures they can last anywhere from uh, one hour to five hours so uh, especially if there's advanced severe and extensive uh, disease present and therefore uh, we obviously we will have to provide um, the proper environment for the anesthetized animal where we uh, um, are able to control things like um, temperature of the animal. They tend to get really cold very fast because we're using a lot of water. The, um, the power equipment typically is irrigated by water so everything gets wet. They lose uh, temperature very fast. Uh, the animals can be positioned in lateral or, or dorsal recumbency. It's up to you. I like dorsal recumbency because I don't have to be flipping back and forth. And obviously provide adequate anesthesia or analgesia to the animals. Um, anything that gets done in the mouth that is potentially painful will ideally be um, locally anesthetized or regionally anesthetized to be more precise. And that will allow you to uh, have a preemptive approach. It will allow you use lower levels of anesthetic and it will have a much more comfortable, faster recovery uh, in regards to the patient. Okay, so now talking about specifically uh, dental disease, like I said, we're gonna focus on periodontal disease and endodontic disease, which are the two most common um, diseases in dogs and cats. So let's start by defining periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is anything that results in the inflammation or loss of periodontal tissues. It is typically a disease that will progress if we don't intervene and it, the factors that initiate disease are still present or allowed to continue uh, will result in progression of disease invariably. It is a disease that is preventable if, because at least one of the critical factors involved we can control. Um, that is dental plaque. And um, like I um, suggested a, a few minutes ago, it is um, a, a very high prevalence. So what are the periodontal tissues that I just mentioned? Uh, basically four tissues involved in periodontal disease. The gingiva or the gums, the underlying alveolar bone, which is what supports everything in, uh, around the tooth. The cementum is a thin layer of tissue that allows the periodontal ligament to connect between the root and the surrounding of the other bone. So these are the four um, tissues that are typically involved in periodontal disease. Um, one of the critical factors involved in initiation and progression of disease is dental plaque. Uh, dental plaque is, um, I have a slide that explains better what it consists of, but is a thin, uh, sticky, transparent typically, almost invisible uh, layer of material that accumulates on pretty much any hard surface that is in a humid environment like the mouth. And um, it won't uh, come off easily unless it's mechanically removed. You can actually remove it uh, with uh, the, the, um, the most effective way to remove plaque is the use of a toothbrush. That's why uh, 
tooth brushing is recommended to prevent periodontal disease because uh, this layer, sticky layer, uh, will come off. Don't, get, uh, don't think that this uh, yellowish uh, rougher material is plaque. It's more this whitish substance. There's so much accumulated on these two teeth that it's almost um, visible, but typically you don't see it. And this plaque, if allowed to sit there, for uh, more than 24 to 72 hours, we'll start to capture minerals from the environment and become mineralized material, and that's when it turns into calculus, which is what you more easily see clinically. This is an extreme case of calculus accumulation where you can't even see the teeth anymore. They're pretty much uh, connected. They're bridged together by calculus. Now, interestingly, Calculus is not directly responsible for periodontal disease initiation and progression. Contrary to common belief, it's uh, not only indirectly related. It's indirectly related in the sense that it, because it's a rough, irregular surface, it promotes or favors um, accumulation of plaque. And plaque, which is the substance that contains um, a lot of things, among them uh, millions of bacteria, are uh, plaque is the one that actually is involved directly with disease, but not calculus, at least not directly. And it, uh, because of that, it correlates very poorly with severity of disease. And uh, this is another um, important uh, concept that I want to transmit, and that is never uh, base your diagnosis um, of, or at least your impressions of severity and extent of periodontal disease based on the amount of calculus accumulation. There will be cases where you have minimal calculus present and severe disease, and the opposite will also be perfectly possible, where you have plenty of calculus accumulation, yet minimal uh, or uh, not necessarily severe stages of periodontal disease. Now, uh, in regards to pathogenesis of periodontal disease, this is uh, the stages or steps through, go, through which uh, disease go, goes through. Uh, the first stage is um, purely inflammatory condition of the soft tissue of the gingiva. So in this illustration, we're showing plaque accumulation in this area. This is the critical area, by the way, which I, I forgot to mention, that everything in regards to periodontal disease happens right here in the sulcular space. This is where the gingiva kind of meets with the tooth, and uh, it's supported by alveolar bone. So all the disease will uh, start and progress right here in this sulcular space. If there's plaque right here present, it will um, lead to a host response, an inflammatory response, and we have gingivitis. If we are constantly removing this plaque from here, this gingivitis will resolve, will reverse. So gingivitis is considered reversible, in, um, especially if we are able to control plaque. It will uh, typically completely reverse and the animal will not have permanent uh, damage of the periodontium. If the plaque is allowed to sit there, to stay there, and is not uh, removed mechanically with a toothbrush, then in some cases, not all, but in some cases, um, it will start to um, cause destruction, loss of tissues. And this is when we reach the periodontitis stage or phase of the disease. This one is irreversible because what we lose here, the alveolar bone, once it's lost, and other periodontal tissues, they will not come back. You can stop the progression of the disease if you remove the inciting cause, the plaque and indirectly calculus, but you will never, uh, no matter how much you treat, you, will, you won't come back to this status. And if left untreated, it will continue to progress. Eventually, uh, there will be so much loss of tissue that the tooth will the end result is natural or exfoliation of the tooth at some point, but that can take months, years. Periodontal disease typically uh, is a very slowly progressing disease. There are forms of disease uh, that are um, considered of rapid progression, but typically it's a chronic disease. This is just a, to illustrate what of the plaque or how the plaque looks um, on the tooth. This, these are typically clusters of um, a matrix, fluid, uh, nutrients, uh, oxygen, etc., and uh, clusters of bacteria that uh, can be easily removed from the surface of the tooth with a toothbrush. Anything else that is not mechanical, say uh, rinses, sprays, antiseptics, etc., will at best stay on top and will actually penetrate. 
So uh, the only and best way to control plaque is by mechanical means, and that is the toothbrush. And because everything is in the sulcus, or at least the part we worry about, then toothbrushing is uh, the best tool because the bristles of the toothbrush will actually be the ones that reach this area. Uh, things like chews and um, uh, treats uh, will probably re help remove plaque from the crown of the tooth, but not in the sulcus or a sulcular space. So toothbrushing is by far the best way to uh, control and prevent disease. And this biofilm, or you know, plaque is actually a biofilm, is uh, a very complex and organized uh, ecosystem. Uh, and the bacteria involved, are, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of uh, different bacteria that can be present here. Some are considered more virulent or pathogenic than others. But ultimately, uh, um, what determines which animals develop disease and uh, who doesn't will depend a lot on the host itself. So susceptibility is a big factor involved here uh, because we may have the inciting cause present, the plaque, the bacteria, etc. But we, if we have um, a host that is not necessarily susceptible, then disease will always be relatively mild or won't be present. Or in other situations, we have a uh, minimal presence of plaque, uh, but a very susceptible host. We have, um, there's a pretty good chance that that animal will develop disease no matter how much prevention is implemented. Uh, from a clinical point of view, the presentation of periodontal disease typically includes, like I said, halitosis, difficulty eating, tylism, uh, gingival bleeding, and loss of um, teeth. From a radiographic point of view, um, and, and when we have the anesthetized patient, the sequence of events, typically at least the way I like to do it, is take the full mouth radiographs first and then do the clinical examination. Uh, this is just to show what a healthy periodontin would look like radiographically. We have nice alveolar bone uh, covering the entire roots of every single tooth. We have a regular uh, periodontal ligament space, uh, which is this dark, lucent line around uh, each root. Um, so there's really no signs of loss of tissues uh, in this case. In early phases of disease, and mild is defined as less than 25% of attachment loss, and notice that we are talking about periodontitis, which is a, a form of disease where loss of tissue occurs. We have less than 25% of that alveolar bone gone. Yet, also uh, worth no, uh, pointing at is that even though it's early, look at uh, the frication area in this tooth, for example. Uh, the frication is so close to the alveolar margin that even very early stages of the disease will seriously compromise this um, area of the tooth. And this is clinically significant because once we have a through and through defect, that's it for the tooth. It's uh, considered uh, beyond repair or, necessary, or extraction is indicated. And why? Uh, simply because this will be a uh, site permanently filled with plaque and it will be a permanent site of inflammation that won't be easy to control or keep clean. So even mild or early forms of periodontitis are um, already clinically significant. As disease progresses, this is what it would look like radiographically. We have um, continued bone loss. Um, so furcations are even more involved right here and here. Furcations obviously are not present in teeth with only one root, like this molar. And uh, severe disease, which is defined as more than 50% of attachment loss, of uh, alveolar bone loss, um, uh, not only represents a problem for the tooth, but can potentially start to compromise more uh, delicate structures like the jawbone itself. So this is not uncommon um, to see in toy breeds, for example. Mandible has, in a small dog, they have proportionally, disproportionately big teeth in regards to the jaw bone. So uh, even moderate or you know, more severe forms of disease can seriously compromise the structure um, of, the, of the bones. And this is what, just one example of what can result from periodontal disease, a pathological fracture. In cats, it's very similar to the situation. We have a healthy cat with normal periodontium or alveolar bone, early stages of disease, um, already starting to compromise vacation areas, uh, moderate and severe forms. 
So the clinical examination, just as you will have a lot of very useful information from the radiograph, um, then the clinical exam will also offer some um, important information. Tooth mobility is one parameter that you have to interpret with caution because um, just as it can reflect s severe disease sometimes, there's uh, not necessarily severe disease yet, uh, mobility is significant. And why that is? Uh, some teeth, the smaller teeth with only one root, will develop mobility at a relatively early uh, phase of disease, whereas multi-rooted teeth or big teeth won't develop mobility until pretty much the uh, final stages of disease. So it has to do with uh, size and number of roots, and therefore it should be interpreted with caution. It should not be used as the only criteria to decide what to do with a tooth. So more important than mobility are things like sulcular depth, because if the periodontal probe um, can reach uh, more than three millimeters in a dog, that's considered abnormal, that's considered a pathological change. In cats, it's uh, somewhere between half, point, half, point 0.5 sorry, and one millimeter, that would be normal. Anything beyond that would be considered pathological. And it is a very good indicator of how much alveolar bone loss has occurred. So um, if you have uh, anything beyond these uh, numbers, you can pretty much be sure that there's uh, alveolar, alveolar bone loss that will uh, actually correlate very well with what you saw radiographically. And not to get confused with pseudopockets because when there's enlargement of the gingiva, it will tend to uh, lead to um, also increased probing depths, but it's not due to loss of alveolar bone, but with, uh, it's secondary to the growth of the tissues. Um, another um, common manifestation of loss of uh, attachment will be gingival recession. So the gingiva, when the alveolar bone law, or when the alveolar bone um, disappears, the gingiva will no longer have the osseous support and it will sometimes migrate along with the bone and that will manifest clinically as um, areas of gingival recession. This is just an extreme case. And you can also have gingival uh, recession and increased probing depth simultaneously and that will um, indicate that the sum of the two are at the actual um, um, clinical attachment loss will actually be the sum of the gingival recession and the probing depth. So the, um, the amount of loss or when there's attachment loss it can either manifest as gingival recession or probing therefore the sum of the two is uh, what uh, reflects or ultimately indicates how much true uh, bone loss there is. In multi-rooted teeth, like I said, uh, forcation uh, area is an important um, one to check and you, s you may not necessarily see that there's uh, a lot of recession going on or deep pocketing um, in order to get a, a through and through defect right here. So I don't know how much alveolar bone loss had occurred here but it looks like not necessarily much yet the probe is already going through. So this tooth, I bet you it's not even close to loose and uh, pocketing is probably not that significant, yet it's already ready to come out. That, this is why um, checking the forcation area is um, important. Or nasal fistula is another important uh, consideration uh, in periodontal disease because first it's very common, especially in certain breeds, not only called cephalic breeds, have a propensity to develop these. They're typically uh, located on the palatal aspect of the maxillary canine teeth. Uh, and it happens because uh, alveolar bone loss occurs circumferentially around the tooth, including the palatal aspect of the tooth. And this is just to show a probe that is going right directly into the nose. The, the, the fistula is not obvious because the tooth is in the way, but once you take out the tooth, you will uh, see the big hole. So I bring this up because they're common and they are um, surgically involved and you have to be uh, properly equipped and uh, adequately trained um, to do these because otherwise they will result in a permanent um, communication with the nose with, which has a lot more uh, clinical implications. Just, just to show you how this tooth would be done, um, a big pedicle flap would be raised uh, to releasing incisions full thickness, mesial and distal or in the caudal and dis distal and uh, rostral aspects of the tooth that will uh, allow a relatively atraumatic removal of the tooth. Then the big hole is revealed. That's the nose right here. 
and everything gets cleaned up, rinsed, uh, debrided. There's typically a lot of granulation, inflammatory tissue around. There's a, usually a rim of uh, epithelium around this defect, so everything has to be very, very um, almost aggressively debrided, and then you can um, safely close the site up with, um, with a tension-free closure, and if done properly, this will have a really good prognosis. If uh, things are not done properly, the most likely result is that the hole will reappear and then all the clinical implications of that will occur. How is uh, periodontal disease treated? Um, treatment is uh, mostly mechanical in nature and it consists of removal of the inciting cause, that is plaque and indirectly calculus. And, uh, sorry, and um, anything uh, that is beyond a certain point or stage of disease uh, typically gets extracted. So in dogs, uh, in cats, in animals in general, we don't uh, take heroic measures to try to save a tooth that we know uh, will be really hard to save in the long term. So anything that is beyond a certain stage of disease typically gets extracted. Uh, the criteria to when to extract the tooth will, um, I'll show you in the slide uh, shortly. Uh, and this slide, I want to just point out that prophylaxis is an um, inaccurate term. Uh, when we do periodontal treatment, which is what we uh, sometimes know as prophylaxis, we are most of the times treating established disease. We're not really preventing anything, so I discourage the use of the term prophylaxis. Um, the treatment plan will only be possible when you have collected all the clinical information and the radiographs and typically will include scaling, uh, performing regional blocks if you're doing extractions and um, sometimes there's other work to be done in this mouth, not only periodontal. Mechanical removal of uh, deposits are uh, ideally done with a power instrument, an ultrasonic scaler. Uh, for the sake of efficiency, we if we were to do with hand instruments, we would take hours and hours, so we need to be efficient. So everything gets done typically with a uh, scaler, the removal of deposits is, uh, at least. And I would say this is a critical slide right here because this is when at least I uh, typically decide from uh, very objective uh, parameters when to extract the tooth. And that would be stage three frication means a defect that has a through and through defect in the frication. Probing depths of more than six millimeters would be another indicator to take the tooth out. And if radiographically there's more than 50% of attachment loss. Stage of mobility, like I said, is uh, the less reliable of all the uh, parameters. And if there's anything uh, more serious like an orinacial fistula, uh, obviously we, before we can repair the fistula, we'll have to remove the associated tooth. These so are just examples of uh, after a thorough comprehensive diagnostic process has been done, uh, what can result. So it's not dentistry or periodontal treatment is not about calculus removal, it's about recognizing the disease and treating it appropriately and that may sometimes include, for example, uh, having to take out all the teeth, sometimes. Uh, another example, it's not about removal of these deposits, which uh, are bothersome to the eye, but uh, clinically they're not that important because we're leaving behind uh, large areas of alveolar bone loss here. Uh, this is more than half of the root is exposed. Here's the through and through defect in the frication area. So uh, the real treatment, if we were to perform it in this dog, would be most likely um, extracting these two teeth. Another example of uh, how sometimes disease is there, uh, just not manifesting um, clearly. This tooth has a relatively normally appearing gingiva, minimal calculus deposits, uh, so, nothing too exciting except for a little pinpoint uh, defect right here, um, which if you were to probe, you would uh, see that it's um, going uh, through and through, through the soft tissue. It's, it's a draining tract, and this is the same dog. The probe sinks all the way in along that root, and the radiograph reveals that there's literally no bone left around that distal root of the fourth premolar. That's a root uh, after it was removed covered in calculus down to the very tip. So um, if you implement a thorough comprehensive uh, diagnostic approach, you will be able to recognize disease um, and treat it appropriately. Antibiotics are um, another 
uh, sensitive topic because they are uh, abused, unfortunately. Periodontal disease does not respond to antibiotic treatment. Uh, the only way to treat control disease is by mechanical surgical intervention. And uh, the, uh, there are a few indications uh, for antibiotic use in periodontal disease, but uh, typically uh, they will only apply if there's an active impression, uh, infection, say a, a swollen face, a draining tract, uh, or intraoperatively if the patient is immunosuppressed and will be uh, the bacteremia that we cause while mechanically manipulating teeth uh, will may be of concern if the animal is immunosuppressed. But most of the times if, you have, if we have an immunocompetent animal and we are able to treat uh, in a comprehensive manner the disease, uh, antibiotics are not really necessary. Pulse therapy, which is a concept uh, advocated by some, consists of giving for a few days every month or every so often a course of oral antibiotics to tr control supposedly disease. Uh, this is not only totally ineffective, but potentially harmful to the animal. So I discourage its use. And we have a very uh, short time to go over endodontic disease, so I'm going to uh, go through these very fast. So endodontic disease is dental disease that affects anything that is inside the tube. That it's the, uh, the part endo means inside. So basically we're talking about anything that affects the, the pulp tissue, the, the in lay terms, the nerve of the tooth. Um, the pulp cavity, which is the inside of the tooth, can, uh, is uh, divided into three different areas. The root canal is the part uh, that the, is uh, present in the root. The pulp chamber is the part in the crown. And in multi-rooted teeth that have more than one cusp, there's the pulp horns. One here, one here, and one here. Everything, uh, all the, the three of them together, form the pulp cavity. This is where the pulp, which is connective tissue, lives, the vital part of the tooth lives. And it's commun the communication between the pulp and the surrounding tissues happens right here in the apex. There's tiny little channels, uh, the so-called apical frame or apical delta is present right here. This is where blood vessels uh, and nerves go in and out of the pulp. So anything that happens inside the tooth, if something goes wrong inside the tooth, the inflammatory response will typically happen around the apices because that's where uh, it communicates with the surrounding tissues. The pulp is, like I said, connective tissue with a lot of uh, innervation and irrigation. And uh, an important cell type in the pulp is the odontoblasts, uh, which are uh, the cells that produce the hard tissue of the tooth, the dentin. And um, the dentin, on the other hand, which is in this diagram, this is enamel, the outer layer of the tooth, dentin, and this is a pulp cavity. The odontoblasts have these extensions that penetrate into the dentin, and therefore dentin is porous. Enamel is not porous, it's really hard, but the underlying dentin is somewhat softer than compared to the enamel and is porous. So if there's areas of dental exposure, they will um, at least indirectly allow communication with the pulp cavity. So even if you don't have direct communication from a trauma, say a fractured tooth with the pulp cavity, there's the risk of injury to the pulp via these uh, small openings. Uh, like I said, when disease in the tooth happens, it manifests around the root. This is what uh, um, this area of the root, the apex, would look like in a diagram, all these openings. And this is what clinically or radiographically uh, inflammation around the apex looks like. The, it's this typically round, uh, sometimes well, sometimes ill-defined area of uh, bone lysis. And the, this is uh, the result of infection in the root canal or in the pulp cavity and the corresponding host response, inflammatory response around the apex. This is clinically relevant because uh, it is the source of pain, it is the source of inflammation and infection, uh, sometimes so severe that will manifest like a um, pretty uh, ugly draining tract somewhere uh, in the face or um, inside the mouth. Um, uh, manifestations of endodontic disease can be also very subtle. Sometimes you won't even suspect there's endodontic disease present, uh, but sometimes they do manifest um, uh, with obvious signs like the ones we mentioned, or more subtle signs like uh, um, subtle signs of pain, 
or you may identify upon visual inspection a broken tooth, a discolored tooth is also a sign of endodontic disease. Uh, but many times it's uh, mostly asymptomatic. Extraoral exam will, may reveal areas of uh, swelling along the face and the, ultimately the diagnosis will only happen upon oral examination and radiographic examination under dental anesthesia. Uh, this one, I think, is a common situation. A discolored tooth is very common. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen one. And uh, 90 plus percent of these teeth are actually dead teeth. The pulp tissue is dead. And therefore, they require uh, intervention. Intervention, when you have a dead pulp, will either be in the form of endodontic work, say a root canal treatment, or extraction of the tooth. Um, in a fractured teeth, if you have pulp exposure that is confirmed upon visual inspection, like right here, these are considered complicated fractures whenever there's pulp exposure. You invariably have uh, endodontic disease. The pulp is either uh, dead already or in the process of dying if the exposure, exposure happened recently. And this will, uh, no matter what is going on or what stage of um, necrosis this uh, pulp is, it will require root canal treatment or extraction. So whenever you see a broken tooth, even if there's no clinical manifestation of disease, uh, you will have to uh, address it. Another situation, common one, is when you have a tooth fracture that involves the root. That is not only an endodontic issue, but also a periodontal one, because the fact that it goes into the root uh, means that it's altered the periodontium and uh, this is not going to be easy to fix. You can uh, potentially address the endodontic part like doing a, by doing a root canal treatment, but reconstructing the altered periodontium will be a surgical challenge. So whenever you have situations like this, fractures that extend into the root, uh, I would say that in a shelter setting where you probably won't have the capacity to do root canal treatments, uh, you should probably just extract the tooth. Associated clinical signs may be, like I said, uh, very uh, silent or they may be very um, uh, significant like draining tracts or inflammation. Examples, uh, draining tract right here, a pinpoint, very hard to uh, identify, but there. And there, here's the culprit, a uh, broken second premolar. This is uh, the exact, the severity of this process is the exact same one as in this one. Uh, it's just the main difference is that most likely this is going to be missed and this one is going to be identified. Another example, a draining tract under the eye. A look in the mouth. Uh, it doesn't look horrible. Uh, it may be uh, like there's a little fracture right here with pulp exposure but not clear because the tooth is covered in calculus. Uh, but a, a good oral exam under general anesthesia and a radiograph will confirm the problem. Radiographically, uh, typically, like I said, there's, um, there can be a lucent area, a halo around the root. Uh, you can see a discrepancy in the pulp cavity width, which will uh, reflect nothing else but um, death of the pulp, uh, because the normal process is for the walls of the tooth to become thicker and thicker as the animal ages. This one uh, no longer got thicker because the pulp died a while ago, so it stayed the same width it was when it died. A few more examples, um, chronic draining tract along the ventral margin of the uh, right mandible in this dog. Take a radiograph and here's the um, source of the problem. Root canal treatment is uh, basically removing the pulp, necrotic pulp, cleaning up the canal and filling it with materials that are biocompatible and prevent bacteria from reaching this area. It's typically something that is um, done by specialists. Uh, so. Um, not something that I would uh, recommend doing in a in, um, general practice uh, setting or in a shelter, uh, but just to point out that it is uh, quite effective. It's certainly a valid alternative. Um, and when you have an acute fracture of a tooth, when it just became exposed, you have the option of doing an emergency treatment, which is putting a little filling material over the pulp cavity or over the exposed pulp in hopes that it will the underlying pulp will survive, uh, but the success rate is only 80% and you will have to follow up because it will only be possible to say if, it's, if it was successful or not by taking a radiograph. Thank you.